evening. Good to see everyone tonight. Let's stand together if you would join me in singing Only a Sinner, Saved by Grace, number 356. Let's sing that together. Not have I gotten but what I receive. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner. to see everyone here this evening and uh, looking forward to a great service tonight and it's great to be back after being gone out to California preaching a missions conference and uh, so glad to be back this evening and looking forward to the service so let's go ahead and pray and we'll ask the Lord's blessing on our service tonight. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come this evening, uh, Lord, just to worship you and uh, to lift your name up. And Lord, we do thank you, uh, Lord, that even those of us uh, that are just sinners, Lord, we can say that we are saved by grace. And Lord, not what we have done, but what you have done for us and sending your son to die on the cross for us. And Father, we just thank you for the gift of, of eternal life that we have through your son. And Lord, we ask that you just bless tonight in our service as we just lift your name up. We ask that you'd be glorified through the singing. Uh, Lord, even through the giving tonight and through the message, I pray that you just uh, use the message to continue to speak to our hearts as we study through the book of Joel and to just look to you. And Father, just bless in our service tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, we'll remain standing and sing, He Included Me, number 355. Words the soul to thrill, oh, with what joy they my heart do fill. 
fill For when he said Whosoever will Jesus included me too Jesus included me Yes, he included me When the Lord said Whosoever He included me Jesus included me Yes, he included me when the Lord said, Whosoever he included me. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. All right, just a couple of announcements here, and then we'll have our ushers come and take up our offering. Uh, again, don't forget, tomorrow night uh, at 6.30, we have our outreach, and so uh, we're working to try to, uh, Lord willing, finish up uh, the city of Eaton, and we still have a little bit on the, the north that we've got to do, and then uh, the southern part, and so uh, I really think in the next, uh, t this month in November, I think we can finish it up. Uh, I will say this, we might have to uh, change up a little bit next month. Uh, I, I would I should have thought about it this month as well, but um, it's getting darker earlier. And uh, like already starting to get dark around uh, dusk is starting to be around seven o'clock and things nowadays. And so uh, we'll go ahead and we'll do tomorrow's. And so we'll try to do as much as we can tomorrow. Uh, but then next month, we'll probably try to shoot to do it maybe on a Saturday morning or something like that where it's uh, daylight and things like that. So we have enough time to to get stuff done. So, but come out with us tomorrow night, 6.30. Uh, get there a couple minutes early. That way we can get everybody paired up. And again, if you've never done it before, don't, don't, don't worry. We won't send you out by yourself. You're not going to have to do any talking or anything like that. Uh, but you can go with somebody who can do the talking thing. So come out with us as we invite folks to come to church. And then, of course, uh, several things coming up as well. We have the teen activity. Uh, they're going to be doing a progressive dinner on, uh, on Friday. Have you ever done a progressive dinner before? If you have, how many don't know what a progressive dinner is, right? So basically they go from the, they, they, is it like a five course meal or something like that they do? So like uh, they'll go to one place and they'll have like a salad and that's all they have at that, that person's house. And then they'll go to somebody else's house and then they'll have like the main meal there or something. And then they'll go to somebody else's house and finally get a drink. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but then they'll go to somebody else's house and then they'll get like a dessert and, and they'll have, they have it all, uh, an appetizer and all that kind of stuff. So it's a really fun thing. They get to go to different people's houses and, uh, and eat along the way. And so they'll have a fun time with that. So uh, make sure the teens are there for, for that on Friday. And then this coming Sunday evening, we have our youth service. And so really looking forward to that. Young people are preparing for that, for our youth service. And so that'll be at 5 o'clock this Sunday evening. Invite someone to come to that. That's always a blessing to see the young people doing the service and the young men preaching and things. So I would encourage you to invite somebody to come to that. Uh, I was inviting some folks today, somebody that works in the city here uh, with, with some of the young people there. And I told them, I said, hey, you know, I, I know you work with uh, some of the young people in the city and things. And uh, you ought to come out and, and join us for our uh, youth service and uh, see some young people that have a desire to serve the Lord. And so uh, invite somebody to come to that. And we'll have a great time there. And then just a couple things coming up. Don't forget, we do have a baptism Sunday, October the 30th. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday. And so if you're interested in getting baptized, uh, you can sign up uh, online for that. And that way we can know who exactly who's going to be baptized. And then we'll uh, contact you about that. So if you're interested in being baptized, please uh, get registered for that. You can go to right to the church uh, website. Uh, there might even be a, church, a link on the Facebook page as well. But I know that's there on the website also. Um, and then also don't forget the first Sunday of uh, December, uh, we did this last year and the Lord really blessed uh, in our building fund. And the first Sunday of December, we're going to take up a special uh, offering for our building fund. And uh, that will be a special giving Sunday. Uh, other than tithe and things like that, but everything that comes in that Sunday will be for our building fund. And so I hope that you'll be praying uh, about what the Lord would have you to give for that. Uh, I know some have maybe been already giving throughout the year, but uh, this is a time where we can give a special offering for the building fund. And uh, I'm really praying. Uh, obviously, we, we've already talked a little bit about this, but uh, we'll have a little bit of a mortgage uh, once we get the new building. But I'm really praying that we can knock that out as fast as possible. Um, and so you pray about maybe what the Lord would have you to give uh, individually or as a family or something like that. And uh, we'll try to raise uh, some money there for our building fund. Uh, so that will be on December the 4th. So don't forget about that. We'll have our ushers go ahead and come at this time. We'll take up our offering.
uh, this evening and uh, just giving back faithfully to the Lord as he is blessed. Uh, Brother Andy Kud, would you come and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering, please? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come tonight, Lord, and Lord, we thank you that you've blessed us and Lord, that you've taken us just as we are, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you love us. And Father, I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll just bless this offering that we're about to take up. Lord, I pray that it'll be used for your honor and your glory. We thank you for all that you have done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> my Lord, send me. What a great song. Let's stand together if you would, and we'll sing together. Number 357, tell me the story of Jesus. <clears throat>
Amen. That's a great song. Tell me the story of Jesus. And I hope uh, your desire is to tell others that story. Uh, tell what Jesus Christ did for you and, and for me. And uh, man, what a blessing it was being able to be out in California preaching a missions conference, which is what that song is all about, telling the story of Jesus. And uh, appreciate all those who have been praying for my wife and I while we were there and uh, safety there and then traveling back. And uh, the Lord just really blessed through the conference. It's great. Uh, I told the church there, I said, it's really great to be a part of their missions conference because it's just getting me that more excited for our missions conference coming up next month. And I said, this is the, this is the best of two worlds. I get this missions conference and another one next month. And so uh, you can't beat that. And so just really looking forward to our missions conference coming up next month. I hope that you're praying about that and uh, praying what the Lord would have us to give as a church and uh, just being faithful in, in that and telling others about the Lord. Uh, but it's great to be back. Uh, again, appreciate all the prayers. Uh, but Dad, go ahead and come. I know you're going through the book of Joel. I was really shocked last week as I was watching. Um, I know they were having the kids thing and he ended early. I, could, I, I thought he would go to like the last minute push of the time a little bit, you know. I, I was very proud of you, Dad. I was, the night's not over. Last week I was proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And I didn't sing a solo tonight either. I made sure I was turned off, stuck it in my pocket. Amen. Turn your Bible to the book of Joel. Going to have fun tonight. <laughs> We're actually going to get into just a little bit of the book of Joel. We don't start verse by verse. Uh, the other week I talked about the title being observations, and then last week it was more observations, and the title this week is the final observations. There's no more. <laughs> there is, but we won't cover them all. I want you to learn, learn something about the Lord tonight. Learn something about God. And as you read these things, and I hope you've been reading them day by day, every week, every week, I try to go back and read it every day, the whole book, to where it, it really starts becoming a part of your life. And you begin to see things that maybe you hadn't seen before. And that's what we're going to see, some observations tonight. So, uh, as we get into this, let's pray. Father, Lord, use these scriptures in our hearts to make us more like Thee. Lord, help me tonight to bring out the truth that you want to be shown. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and the honor for everything that's done in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look in verse chapter 1 and verse number 6. Chapter 1, verse number 6. For a nation has come up upon what? My land. Oh, y'all are, y'all are quiet. My land. My Land, strong without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he had the cheek teeth of a great lion. Notice verse 7. He hath laid, what? My vine waste and barked. Whose fig tree? My fig tree. He hath made clean bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Go to chapter 2 and verse number 1. He said, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, stand or sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Go on down to chapter 3. Well, we can stay in chapter 2. Go to verse number 20, 25. He says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent unto you. In verse number 27, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Chapter 3, look at verse number 5, or verse number 2. He says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for what? My people and for my heritage, Israel. Look in verse 5. He says, because ye have taken my silver and my gold 
and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. Do you get the picture already? Nothing that you and I have belongs to us. You hear everybody saying, my body, my choice, not your body. Whether you're saved or lost, it doesn't belong to you. It's his by creation. He created it. He owns it. He is the sovereign God. And as you go all the way through here, it doesn't make any difference if it's chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3. Everything that he talks about here belongs to God. He mentions this 18 times. We just read a few. 18 times in here he says, that's mine. Even the armies that he sends, that's mine. Lost armies commanded by lost people like Putin and all those, that's mine. And he said, I sent it. So all of these things that we have are still his. Doesn't make any difference if your job or your family or your land or your house or your church or your talents or your abilities or your 401ks or whatever. Everything you have and I have is his. And why I bring this out is because so many times when God says something once, that's enough. But 18 times he has reminded us through three chapters, I want you to know something. It's not yours. It's his, not just a tithe. Yes, the tithe belongs to the Lord. But all 100% of what you have is his. It's not, I give God his, his 10%, the 90 is mine. No, no. He's reminding us over and over. It doesn't make any difference if it's the corn, if it's the land, if it's the heritage, if it's the people. It, it, no matter what it is, the gold, the silver, all the precious things, everything is mine. And so as we get in here, he's going to be reminding them as he will us that all these things that he has blessed us with. It's not ours to start with. It's his. Now, God blesses us. Nothing wrong with having things. But do I acknowledge his authority over me and those things? And he had to deal with Israel several different times about this very thing. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, and verse number 16. It says, who fed thee? Well, that's a good way to start it out. God's reminding them, hey, who gave you that food? Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not? Watch why he did it. Why he blessed them. That he might humble thee and that he might Prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. Three things. He says, I'm doing this to humble you. You think you are the cock of the walk. You think you have all the talent in the world. Boy, I'm, the company should be glad to have me. No, you should be glad to have breath to breathe. We should be able to have, thank God for the muscles that we have. The other day when I got sick, I mean, I was so dizzy, I couldn't hardly walk across the room. And God reminded me of what I'm preaching. Without God completely taking control of my life, I couldn't even walk across the room. I couldn't see, I couldn't speak. My heart would stop, my lungs would quit breathing. Everything that I have is his. And he wants it all. He says, I want to do thee good. 
But he says, I'm giving you all of this. What did he say? To prove thee. How we doing with what he gave us? How we doing with our, our, our finances? How we doing with our home? How we doing with our job that he gave us? Well, I'm afraid to witness they might fire me. Who gave you that job? He did. We have that responsibility to him, and God can give us another job just as good as he did that last one. Well, my family members, they, they'll think I'm nuts if I witness to them. They probably will. Mine did. But you know, in these latter years, they're coming back and asking questions. And God's finally softening their hearts. You don't do that by just staying quiet. God has to continue to use that you in that family for the influence that he needs to bring people to Jesus Christ. The reason he's doing is he says to do thee good at the la thy latter end. He said, I'm wanting to bless you. I'm wanting to do something that you have no idea. I look back in my life and, and, and man, I, I didn't have enough. When I, I remember when, before we went to Bible college and, and honest to God, I, I, I sat there and I didn't have two nickels to rub together and it was her birthday. It makes you feel like a real sweet husband. And as we surrendered to God and said, okay, God, we're going we're gonna to serve you. And God sent us on a path that I had no idea was, was possible before me. And I wouldn't trade it for anybody. God has so blessed us. It's absolutely amazing. Deuteronomy 13, 3. God allows false teachers. He allows false leaders, things like that. But the question I want you to think about, do I believe what I believe or is it because the preacher believes this? Can I show somebody what I believe from the word of God or is it just, well, that's what they told me at church? You should have such a command of the scriptures that you can sit down and answer whatever questions that your children bring forth or your wife, husbands, or your husband, wives. You need to know the book too. How else will you know what's true or false? You can't just call up the preacher. Yeah, he believes something and he preaches it and he, he lives it. But if that's all you've got, you don't have much. Why are our teenagers when they reach 18 and they graduate from high school and that you don't see them again in the churches? Because they didn't believe what you believed. You didn't teach them. You told them. You, 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 you made them obey the rules, but they, they didn't believe it in their hearts. You have to lead and instruct in your homes and spend that time with your children, showing them, explaining, why am I going to whoop the fire out of you? And then explain it to them. This is what God says. And this is why this is wrong, and this is why you need to be punished. Now, there's a right way and wrong way to go about punishing people. I know that, but we're not getting into that tonight. Deuteronomy 13, 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you. When that guy's preaching, I don't care if it's Benny Hinn or, or Joel Osteen or the, a lot of these false prophets. You better be able to tell the difference. Otherwise, your kids are going to start following the wrong spiritual leaders. They're going to get online and they won't be able to discern what's right and wrong. And they're going to go the wrong direction. You have to be able to point out who's, who's a good preacher and who's not. Who's preaching the truth and who is not. And if you don't know the book, you can't guide them. He said, I have let these guys be here 
to prove you. To prove you. To know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See, we say we love the Lord with all our heart and all our soul, but if we don't even really read his book and study it, if we don't know this thing. Look, this is the greatest book in all the world. Would you agree? This, this gives us the answers to everything in this world. We was talking today, visiting a couple, and, and, and we said, the problem today is not politics. It is right here. The thing is, you've had some guys choose the devil's way, and you have some that have chosen God's way. But even Christians are, are, are too malignant dumb that they can't even figure out which way is right and which way is wrong. And that's why they'll vote for different people that, that, that have chosen the wrong way. It's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem. And the only thing that's going to get these things solved is Christ. We have to understand and know what God says. And he says, I'm putting this stuff out here to prove you. To prove you. To see if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We say it. It's easy to say. But when it comes right down to it, I'm not willing to take my time and study this book. I'll just wait and let preacher tell me something in church. No, we need to get in the book and we need to study. I'm, I'm really surprised. I sat there when he had Sunday school. It irritates the fire out of me. Because I'm sitting there, I mean, I've been a professor, I've been a pastor, I've been a dad, all this, that, and the other, missionary, what, all that stuff. And I've got an answer, and I'd like to, but I don't answer, and I'm not going to. Why? Because you need to answer. You need to answer. I'm shocked that there are no more questions than there is. What does that tell me? We're not studying. Every time I go to the book, I find questions. I find questions that I have to, this morning devotions, I, after a couple of hours, I went back and I started studying out this and that and the other because there's questions there. If we don't have questions, because we're not in the book. Now, he said, I'm doing this to prove you, Okay. God says, all of these things are, are mine. Your time, your job, your family, everything. So what we need to do is take what God has given us and absolutely make it profitable. Profitable unto God. Now, he goes on, we'll read this in, as we get to the verses. But God gave Judah corn. He gave him grain. He gave him wine and oil, silver, gold, pleasant things, and work, all this. All these things were gifts to God. They were gifts from God, but now, in order to show that they acknowledged his authority... They were to bring their tithes. They were to bring their free will offerings. They were to bring all of this back to the altar and say, God, I'm acknowledging that this come from you. Everything I've got come from you. Not just a tithe, but the free will offerings. The offerings they took for the building, just like in the Old Testament. All of this stuff. It all belongs to God, and that's why we need to be in prayer and say, God, what do you want me to give? And then it don't make any difference what the amount is. If you do what God says, you're right with God. If he says give a nickel, give a nickel. If he says give 5,000, give 5,000. Whatever it is, God knows. And he's proving us with things. Do we really love him like we say? Giving it back to him. His, he's the Lord of my life. 
The problem was, as you see here in chapter 2 and chapter 3, they gave the corn, they gave the wine, they gave the oil, they gave all this stuff to the gods of Baal. They didn't give it to God. God blessed them with it, but what they did is they used it on themselves and on the false gods. Self-pleasure. And God, in this book, is going to hold them accountable for what they did with the 100%. Not just part of it, but he's going to make them accountable for what it is. So what has God given us? Health, children, money, freedom, all these things. Everybody ought to vote. Why? God has given us the freedom in America to vote. Amen. And he's going to count us responsible whether we get involved or not. All of these things are spiritual issues, not, not just secondary, physical, or governmental issues. They're spiritual issues. That's the first observation. Secondly, there's an interlude that comes in here as we see, and we'll go through that here in a little bit uh, if I can keep running as fast as I can run. After Joel sets the stage in chapter 1 with locusts and with this, this invasion, and we'll talk about that in detail when we get there, uh, and then in chapter 2 he projects that removal of Judah. As, as a people, another, that nation. But then in chapter 2, in verse 28, to the end of chapter 2, actually that is chapter 3 in the Hebrew Bible, this portion. And that's where there's an interlude. After he gets done talking about the, the, the battle with, or the, the, the Babylonian takeover and everything, there's a, there's a beautiful little interlude in here. And it's like there's a breath of fresh air. And then he comes back in chapter 3 and says, that's it. What, he fi what we find in chapter 3, the, the pouring out of the Spirit. This is what Paul, Peter refers to in the book of Acts, or Paul refers to in the book of Acts. The pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh. Peter preached the message and he says... This is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. And he quotes those scriptures, those verses there. And I'm going to show you how that breaks down a little bit later tonight. And that it comes in between the restoration of Judah. They've been taken out of their country. And they, they repent and God brings them back into their country. Then you have this, this interlude where God pours out his spirit upon, upon all men. And then you come and the next thing you see is the tribulation and the millennial, the battle of Armageddon, all of that in chapter 3. And it, and it comes just very rapidly. So understand as you're reading that those verses from chapter 2 verse 28... Uh, to the end of that chapter, originally it was a separate chapter itself because it's like parentheses. You're saying something here, but then you put a thought in here and then you finish your thought later on. The third observation that we see, there's a key phrase. It's easily overlooked, I think, by, by many people. But it clearly, I believe, is a key to the in, entire prophecy here. It is the little phrase, I will. I will. Uh, Thirteen times in 11 verses, he says, I will. It's only in chapter 2 and chapter 3 when he's talking about that, basically that destruction. He shows the sovereignty. He shows his omnipotence. That God is going, he makes the promises, and he is and will fulfill this judgment, these promises that he's making through the prophet Joel. And we could go through a lot of these, but, but we're, we just don't have time. Now understand something. 
God does not need a lightning bolt to kill you. He can do it with a, with a mosquito. Or he can do it with a moth. And that's what he does. The very first chapter, he says, I'll destroy you with a, with a, a grasshopper. We look for the big and we miss the small. And so mark it down. God is going to do exactly what he says in the book of Joel. These things will come to pass. Now, number four. And that's the theme of the book. And this is where I want to spend a little bit of time here. The day of the Lord. That's the theme. The day of the Lord. That's what he's talking about. And, and, and it's, so, it's kind of confusing to many people because there's more than one day, day of the Lord. Now it's referring, and he talks about in his prophecy, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. We're going to look at a couple of these right here. Look at Joel chapter 1, verse 15. Joel chapter 1 and verse number 15. He said, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. He talks about this destruction. The day of the Lord. He's already shown them kind of a day of the Lord that has happened that they didn't even recognize as a day of the Lord. The locust invasion. But now he uses that and he says there's coming what we call the day of the Lord here in verse number, number 15. Look in chapter 2 and verse number 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. Now, what does that tell me? He said it's nigh at hand. It teaches me, every time I go to the book of Joel, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm thinking about the book of Joel when, I, when I'm studying, when I, I'm thinking about the book of Joel when I'm taking a shower. The same thing keeps coming back to my mind. And that's the long suffering of God. We think that we can do something and get away with it and, and God doesn't punish us today. I mean, Jeff, we, we went out here, we did something crazy, okay? You and me. We went out here and we just tore up somebody's place. But nobody saw us. So we sneak away. And we go through this week, nobody said anything. I think we got away with it. Next month, nobody said anything. Forty years from now, nobody knows. Do you realize what God was telling these people through the book of Joel? He promised, I will get you. And he waited 150 years. And the hammer fell. God is long-suffering, and just because Jeff and I didn't get in trouble that night, just because somebody didn't find out it the next week or the next month or years down the road, we think, hey, we got away with it. Oh, no. See, I've got children, and I've got grandchildren, and they will suffer the repercussion of my sins. They'll not just be judged for my sin, they'll be judged for theirs. But by my lifestyle and by what I have done, God says, I am patient, I am patient, I am patient, I am long-suffering, but there comes a time and it's going to happen. That's what he said to Hezekiah. I'll not make these things come to pass in your day, but in your son's day. We, we can't live as if we're getting away with something. God is long-suffering. What a, what a wonderful thing. If he, if he, as soon as I got saved, I went out probably in sin, but yet God didn't just squash me like a bug. 
He loved me, and he took care of me, and he helped me. Chapter 3, verse number 14. Chapter 3 and verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon and be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord will roar out of Zion and he keeps going on. That's the theme of the entire book. Not just in the Old Testament, but in the New. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor wor or by word nor by letter from us as that the day of Christ is at hand, the day of the Lord. He said it was near. And yet, in Paul's time, God was still long-suffering. 2 Peter 3.10 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away in a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are within shall be burned up. Over and over in the Old Testament, I think 30 different times, he mentions the day of the Lord in different contexts. God is serious about this thing. Now, I'm going to show you a, a kind of a presentation that, to help you understand prophecy and what's going on here. Can you put that first slide up, brother? We have something called, now when we're talking about the day of the Lord, we have something called a dual prophecy or a multiple prophecy or they call it a dual fulfillment prophecy and things. Now, as, as you... You hit that next one there, brother. This kind of gives you what the day of the Lord's talking about. The great day of judgment upon the ungodly powers. Jehovah, on the one hand, chastens his people for their sins, and on the other hand, destroys the enemy of his kingdom. That's what's going to happen. Now, next, next one, please, brother. You start out with a prophet. God comes to a prophet. It's amazing that this guy was nothing, but God chose him. You say, oh, I'm nothing. God can do some marvelous things through you. And don't be surprised if, if he doesn't. Because if God could take an old hog farmer and make him a preacher, he can make anybody a preacher. Amen. Now, go to the next one, brother. What Joel sees in chapter 1, he's looking back. That day of the Lord that was in the past, the, that locust invasion that was of God. God sent the locusts to, to eat everything, to destroy them. That's, he said, nothing like it's ever happened before. So you have the past, but now do the next one, brother. Now he says, and in Joel's mind, this is all he's probably thinking. That there is the, the prophecy that God is going to send Babylon in to remove Judah from the land because of their sin, their wickedness. And that's about as far as Joel can see. That's all Joel probably understands as he's proclaiming this and writing it. And there's verses there that, that, that you can write down uh, the year there is 835 B.C. when Joel got the prophecy here. But yet in the future there in 586 B.C. is when Babylon finally came in uh, to take uh, Judah. But then you come to the next one. Now you have that interim period. You have that interlude where there's a freshness. There, there, he said, boy, this is, this is going to be good. This, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all men. And what it is, he had no idea that, that God was looking all the way down to the year in the future when on Pentecost when he poured out his spirit upon all men. He said, well, everybody didn't get the spirit. Everybody can. 
the Holy Spirit's convicting everyone, and it, all they have to do is receive Christ as their Savior, and, and, and they get the Holy Spirit. He seals them. That's when the, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now the last one, brother, or the next one. The day of the Lord that he's prophesying in chapter 3 is about the tribulation and millennial period. You see that from chapter 2 and verse 30 all the way through the rest of chapter 3. He calls it the Valley of Decision, uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat where they will, will meet. Uh, that's the hope of their people that God will come in and, and destroy the enemy and give them back their land, set up his kingdom. And so Joel, when he's seeing this, all he's seeing is that first peak. He doesn't see the other peaks. Now Peter comes along in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 2, and he says this, what was happening on Pentecost, is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Okay? Now, go ahead and turn there. We don't have time to turn there. All right, we'll just go ahead and finish this out. Look. In, in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, read it tonight. He says, this is the prophecy. Now, do the there you go. All Peter was thinking, all he was seeing was what was right before him. And that's what he writes about there. And he says, this is this. Is, uh, this is this. This is the promise. This is the pouring out of the Spirit. And he can, he can see that right in front of his very eyes. He's experiencing it himself. But he doesn't finish part of that prophecy and explain in his message what's going to happen there. Why? Because all he was talking about was the first part, the pouring out of the Spirit. As a prophet, he did not see that other mountain on down there, the Millennial Tribulation. That's not what he was referring to. So when prophets spoke, they saw maybe one aspect, but God was giving prophecy through them on down the line that would come to pass. And that's why they call that the day of the Lord. That's why they call the Babylonian captivity the day of the Lord. That's why he refers back to the, to the locust uh, invasion. So get the context whenever you're reading these things so that you can, you can put it together and see just where the prophet was going, what God was trying to say through all of this. And you're not doing a disservice to that prophet at all. He had no idea. I mean, I dare say Paul did not know what a Sherman tank was. He didn't know what an RPG was. But he knew what a horse was. He knew what armor was, and so he used what was in his mind. The same thing with John and the rest of them. So he sees those peaks, the first peak, but he misses the rest of them. But God had him write it down so we can see them, and we can study them out. So now as we start going through this next week, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you're going to have a better understanding of what we're, what we're doing and why we're saying many of the things we're saying. All right? Now, just, just two questions. Are we being good stewards? Think of all that God's given you. Good husband, good wife, children, grandchildren, job, health, whatever. Are we being good stewards of what God has given us? He's gonna, we're going to give an account. Now, the second question, am I really ready to meet him tonight? Am I ready? Many times I think we say we're ready, but honestly, we're probably not. We need to get ready. Amen? Father, have your will, have your way in our hearts. Thank you for this study. I pray, God, that you'd continue to bless, that we would see your hand in all of this and how you work in our lives 
through the book of Joel and how you can draw us closer to you that you, we might see Christ in us and the world might come to know Christ because we know the word of God and we'll live for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Pastor. Joel, Pastor Joel. <laughs> Somebody come take me. <laughs> Amen.